What do we know about the effect of CR in the laboratory animals on the immune system? Right. So it's a little bit complicated. Um, uh, so first of all, laboratory uh, animals in the laboratory are kept in, in what's called a specific pathogen-free environment. So that doesn't mean there's no pathogens, but it's a relatively low pathogen in, environment where they are not obligated to really use their immune systems against all the challenges that you know we would face in the real world. So one question has come up, uh, are animals that are on calorie restriction immune compromised? And again, I think the data is a little bit mixed, but certainly people have there have been studies where people have done pathogen challenges on CR animals and they respond better. At least the old animals respond better than, than age-matched ad libitum fed control. So ad libitum just means eat as much as you want. Um, but then for certain types of challenges, they, the cal caloric restriction clearly causes a deficit. So Yeah, the sepsis experiments are pretty clear. Yeah. With the, the CR animals compared to controls, when you induce sepsis in them, the, the CR animals right. die much more quickly. Right. And so, of course, the obvious uh, implication of that is that maybe CR would impair immune function in people and lead to higher risk of all, all sorts of infectious yeah. diseases. And this this gets additionally complicated, though, by the, the, the question of, you know, optimal, CR with optimal nutrition. So you might, sometimes you'll see this CRON, C-R-O-N, right? Caloric restriction with optimal nutrition or CRAN, caloric restriction with adequate nutrition, right? So that, that can be done in a mouse, right? We can control all of that. So we make sure that they get all the micronutrients and vitamins that they need when they're on this CR diet. When you move into the real world and people start practicing caloric restriction, that all goes out the window, right? Like I wouldn't, if I wanted to do caloric restriction off the top of my head, I wouldn't even know what to do to make sure that I'm getting optimal nutrition, right? And so in that state where you are CR without optimal nutrition, I think that's where I really become worried about the side effects, particularly as, as you raised um, immune deficits, because you may not, you may not be be getting the nutrient value or the specific micronutrients and vitamins that you need to maintain a functioning immune system. Sure, you may affect some aspects of the biology of aging in a way that you're aging biologically more slowly. That doesn't matter if you get influenza and die, right? So again, I think that's an additional complication that comes into play. When we start talking about, we haven't talked about all the other, you know, anti-aging nutritional strategies. When we start talking about recommending those nutritional strategies to the general public based on solely on mouse studies, I get really concerned because of this environmental complexity that humans live in. Um, not, and we haven't even talked about the genetic complexity, right? So there's all sorts of things that are just different about laboratory animals compared to people living in the real world. And then what can we say about frailty sarcopenia mm -hmm. as it changes in uh, an animal in a, in a CR environment? And, and can that be extrapolated also? Yeah. So I think it's, it's pretty clear, I think, that um, uh, most, much like rapamycin, most functional measures of aging seem to be preserved in calorically restricted animals, including measures of frailty and measures of sarcopenia. And you know, this, uh, the same thing again is true with rapamycin. This actually surprised a lot of people right. when the first studies were done because, you know, the expectation was because mTOR plays such a big role in muscle synthesis that if you inhibit mTOR with rapamycin or caloric restriction, which is a potent inhibitor of mTOR, that you would actually... Uh, see accelerated sarcopenia. And, and that just isn't the observation in laboratory animals. Um, again, we have to be careful not to extrapolate to people, but but it doesn't seem to be the case that you lose muscle uh, muscle mass and function in the way that people would define sarcopenia. I think the important complication here is that all of the caloric restriction studies that I'm aware of, when they look at muscle function, normalize the body weight. weight. Yeah. yeah. And the calorically restricted mice weigh substantially less than the ad libitum fed mice. Usually I think it's on the order of 30, 35% less. Yeah. So, what, yeah, so it's usually grip strength normalized to weight. Right. So what you're actually seeing is that the calorically restricted mice have maintained muscle function proportionate to their body weight. Yeah. And, and I don't know the answer to this, but it's something that I thought of when, when we were talking about this show, um, you know, is let's just say you did that in a person, right? So you've got, you would, you would be able to answer this. I'm sure you've got a 60 year old person, you know, who needs to lose 30% of their body weight. 
but of course you want to maintain their muscle mass, yeah. right? Their muscle function. Would it, would you view it as a good thing or a bad thing if they lost 30% of their body weight and 30% and of their 30 muscle? 30% of their strength. No, we, we, I don't think we would. And I don't think we would view it as a good thing if that, if that, cause again, if you're telling me that someone needs to lose 30% of their body weight, presumably their body composition isn't great to begin with. Yeah. So no, I, I think you would, you would view that as maybe a better thing than where they started, but not optimal either. Yeah. Right. Optimal might be, you would lose 30% of your body weight, but it would disproportionately be adipose tissue right. and you might only lose 10% of your strength or none at all. Right. Right. So again, this, this is depending on the change in lean body mass. Yeah. This is just a complication of the CR studies. And again, you know, even it's, it's hard for me sometimes it takes me, you know, 20, 30 minutes of trying to dig through the paper to really figure out, you know, how, how did they, how did, what normalization did they do to look at metabolic rate or muscle mass or lean mass or, or, or fat mass or muscle function. Right. Um, but usually these studies will be normalized to body weight. This actually comes up also in some of the, um, the intermittent fasting studies where, you know, the question sometimes in these studies is, are they isocaloric or are they calorically restricted when yep. they're put on intermittent fasting? And, um, people will claim they're isocaloric, but the mice lose weight. And what they really are is isocaloric when normalized body weight, right? So, you know, they're really calorically restricted, but you have to kind of dig to, 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 to get how the normalizations were done to really understand. Now, in, when we think about what we know in humans, you know, there was a study that looked at the difference in bone mineral density in people who underwent equal amounts of weight loss one driven by a caloric restriction strategy, one driven by an exercise driven strategy. And the exercise driven weight loss group did not experience a reduction in BMD, but the CR group did. Yeah. So, you know, that's interesting. That's yet another thing that makes you think there's a little more nuance to this, um, which is not to say CR from a weight loss perspective isn't valuable, but it begs the question, you know, is CR the right tool for longevity? Once you've achieved optimal weight, is additional CR beneficial? Well, that makes the assumption we know what optimal weight is. I mean, I think that's kind of the crux of the question, right? We're yes. asking, does CR impact longevity positively? We know if you go on CR, you're going to lose weight. So if the answer to that is yes, then by definition, optimal weight is lower than what we think, right? Well, so, I mean, in I humans guess though, right? Yeah, I know, yeah, but yeah, we don't, yeah, I, we don't I, know. I would say we still don't really know yeah what optimal weight is. Uh, so, so, so again, this, I think just reflects the, the challenges in coming to definitive answers. And I mean, I think maybe the way I think about it more so is, um, you know, what are the concepts? So, so what are the, what are the, uh, downsides potentially to caloric restriction? And if we don't know that caloric restriction has big benefits in terms of health span and perhaps lifespan, um, what are the downsides and do those downsides outweigh the uncertainty we have about whether yeah. caloric restriction is, is beneficial? And, and unfortunately, I think this is something that not very many people in this field pay attention to, right? People are, you know, we all expect if you do a clinical trial of a drug, you're going to report adverse events and, and you're going to look at side effects. Very rarely do people think about that before they write a book recommending that people should do diet X, right? Mm. Even in the clinical trials, some of the nutritional clinical trials, they don't really carefully monitor adverse events. And I think it's just, again, it's a bias in the way we think about interventions. We feel like nutritional interventions are by their very nature safe. And I think you know, certainly for extreme nutritional interventions, that's clearly not true. So I think we should be thinking about what are the risks associated with significant caloric restriction in people as a, as a therapeutic strategy. Uh -huh.